It was half past four on the afternoon of the 31st of December 1799 when an exhausted brother and sister had walked three days on foot from Yorkshire and they came through the gates of this cottage, Dove Cottage in Grasmere. The brother and sister were William and Dorothy Wordsworth. William and Dorothy were born within a year of each other in 1770 and 1771 and lived in this house in Cockermouth on the western edge of the Lake District where their father, John, was the legal and political agent to the Earl of Lonsdale. After a time of separation following their mother's death, in 1795 William and Dorothy moved to houses in Dorset and Somerset, here Al Foxton Hall in the Quantock Hills. But their dream was to return to the Lake District where they had spent their childhood. William had vowed as a boy that here should be my home, this valley be my world. And as he moved into Dove Cottage here in Grasmere, he wrote, And now, tis mine for life, dear Vale, one of thy lowly dwellings is my home. Dove Cottage, built in the early 17th century, used to be an inn, the Dove and the Olive Bough. It had two downstairs rooms and a kitchen, and four tiny rooms upstairs. A few days after William and Sarah arrived in Dove Cottage, he wrote to his friend Coleridge to say that now they'd arrived and though they'd caught troublesome colds they were ho and the place was rather empty and uncomfortable, they were hoping to make it much more comfortable. And in fact, of course, they did. And later on he wrote a poem, part of a poem saying, The lovely cottage in the garden nook hath stirred me deeply with its own dear brook, its own small pasture, almost its own sky. Dorothy wrote a little later about the cottage to her friend Jane Marshall. Our cottage is quite large enough for us, though very small, and we've made it neat and comfortable within doors and it looks very nice on the outside. We've made a lodging room of the parlour below stairs, which has a stone floor, therefore we have covered it all over with matting. The bed, though only a camp bed, is large enough for two people to sleep in. We sit in a room above stairs and we have one lodging room with two single beds, a sort of lumber room and a small low unsealed room which I have papered with newspapers and in which we have put a small bed without curtains. Dorothy and William delighted in their new garden and orchard and called it their paradise and the garden their Eden. And Dorothy wrote about it many times in her journal. May the 6th, Thursday, a sweet morning. We have put the finishing touch to our bower and here we are sitting in the orchard. It is one o'clock. We are sitting upon a seat under the wall. It is a nice, cool, shady spot. The small birds are singing, lambs bleating, cuckoo calling, the thrush sings by fits. Hens are cackling, flies humming, the women talking together at their doors, plum and pear trees are in blossom, apple trees greenish, the opposite woods green and the crows are cawing. We have heard ravens. The ash trees are in blossom, birds flying all about us. The stitchwort is coming out. There is one budding lickness. The primroses are passing their prime. Celandine, violets and wood sorrel for evermore. Little geraniums and pansies on the wall. In 1805, Wordsworth wrote to an acquaintance of his complaining about a large house being built above Grasmere by a Liverpool lawyer called John Gregory Crump. And he wrote about this house. When you next enter the sweet paradise of Grasmere, you will see staring you in the face upon that beautiful ridge that elbows out into the vale, a temple of abomination in which are to be enshrined Mr. and Mrs. Crump. While living at Dove Cottage, William and Mary had three children. So the small little cottage soon became too small. And he, Mary, the three children, 
and Dorothy moved in 1808 to that Temple of Abomination. In fact, they became the first tenants of Allen Bank. It was ironic, but Allen Bank was the only large house that Wordsworth could rent, and the rent was less than Dove Cottage. But this meant that the house had enough room for all his family, for the guests that would come to stay, and space for the children to play on the slopes of Silver Howe and on the banks of Grasmere Lake. We already feel the comfort of each having a room of our own, wrote Dorothy Wordsworth in June 1808. But as the year drew on, the Wordsworth changed their minds, for they realised that the chimneys smoked appallingly on windy days. And Dorothy called the house literally not habitable and complained that dishes are washed and no sooner set in the pantry and they are covered with smoke. And she says, chairs, carpets, and the painted ledges of the rooms are all ready for the reception of soot and smoke, requiring endless cleaning and are never clean. In fact, we have seldom an hour's leisure for all the time that we have for sitting still in the course of the day, we are obliged to employ in scouring. The Wordsworth needed this large house for sometimes as many as 15 people were living there, such as the poets Samuel Taylor Coleridge and Thomas de Quincey. The lease of Allen Bank to the Wordsworths came to an end in June 1811. The family, William, his wife Mary and their children, and Dorothy, William's sister, moved to Grasmere Rectory, a dark, damp house and lacking in privacy. While there, two of William and Mary's children died, four-year-old Catherine and six-year-old Thomas. This made the Wordsworths determined to leave not only the rectory, but also Grasmere. Dorothy wrote, Wherever we look, we are reminded of some pretty action of those innocent children. On the 2nd of May, 1815, the Wordsworths left Grasmere for a place Dorothy called Paradise. Rydal Mount, standing on a hillside overlooking Rydal Water and Silverhow Mountain. Wordsworth rented Rydal Mount from Lady Fleming of Rydal Hall. This was to be the Wordsworths' home for the rest of their lives. The house dates to the 16th century. During the 17th and 18th century, it was extended in various places most notably in 1750, when the owner, John Knott, completely changed the house in order that the main rooms gave views towards Lake Windermere. This is the dining room. The dining chairs belong to the family and the seat covers were worked by Mary and Dorothy Wordsworth and Sarah Hutchinson, Mary's sister. This is the library. A servant at Ride on Mount once said to a visitor, pointing to the bookcase, this is my master's library where he keeps his books. His study is out of doors. Wordsworth's bookcase was bought by Canon H. Rawnsley, who co-founded the National Trust. It was only returned to Rydal Mount in November 2003. Wordsworth's cutlass chair was designed for men who wore swords, which could be drawn whether they were left or right-handed. This was one of the poet's favourite chairs. We are now at William and Mary's bedroom. Wordsworth wrote of his wife in the poem, She was a phantom of delight. A perfect woman, nobly planned, to warm, to comfort and command, and yet a spirit still and bright, with something of angelic light. This is Dora's bedroom. William Wordsworth described his daughter as being quick and clever, very careless and inattentive, but capable of learning rapidly would she give her mind to it. She was her father's constant companion, accompanying him on many of his tours. Dorothy's bedroom. Dorothy Wordsworth was described by Ernest de Selincourt as 
probably the most remarkable and the most distinguished of English writers who never wrote a line for the general public. It was not until 1874, 19 years after her death, that her now famous journals were published. Here is Wordsworth's study. This room was added by Wordsworth and the unusually shaped ceiling is a copy of one which Wordsworth admired on his second visit to Italy. The Wordsworths were all keen gardeners and William designed not only the five acres of garden at Rydal Mount, which has changed little since his day, but also the gardens of many of his friends and neighbours. He believed that a garden should be informal, that it should harmonise with the countryside and should consist of lawn and trees carefully planted so as not to obscure the view. We're going up the 14 steps that William Wordsworth built leading up to the sloping terrace. This is Wordsworth's summer house where he would sit to compose his poetry. Not what we consider a summer house now, mind, because there's only the roof to shelter him from the rain. But it was an escape from the house and he loved it up here. Rydal Mount was the final home of the Wordsworths and here Wordsworth's fame spread. He became an establishment figure, entertained many grand people here and also accepted the honour of becoming Poet Laureate in 1843. After his daughter Dora died in 1847, William went down to a small field between the house and the main road and together with his wife, sister and gardener planted hundreds of daffodils as a memorial to Dora. Wordsworth had bought the land intending to build a house on it, but the plan wasn't followed through. St Mary's Church Rydal was built by Lady Le Fleming of Rydal Hall in 1824 and William Wordsworth helped her choose the site which was originally an orchard. William and his family worshipped here and their pew is the front one underneath the pulpit. There's a plaque remembering William Wordsworth there. He was church warden here too from 1833 to 1844. In the spring of 1850, Wordsworth caught a cold while walking and died of pleurisy on the 23rd of April, the anniversary of Shakespeare's death. He was aged 80 years and 16 days. The Wordsworth family were buried in Grasmere churchyard, the ground being too rocky for burials at Rydal. It is the sense of majesty and beauty and repose, a blended holiness of earth and sky, something that makes this individual sport, this small abiding place of many men, a termination and a last retreat, a centre come from wheresoe'er you will, a whole without dependence or defect, made for itself and happy in itself, perfect contentment, unity centre.